the way we're going to do this is um, we're going to ask our two guests to present uh, some slides uh, showing examples of visualization and talk about them briefly for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes each. And then we're going to begin a conversation which we, we do hope you will join in. So um, we'll kick around a few thoughts from the beginning, but after that we'd very much welcome your, your questions and contributions and comments. Um, so, Sally, can we begin with you? Would you like to okay. show us what you're, you've been thinking about in relation to visualisation of health? The Chief Medical Officer post started as an advisor to the Privy Council. It's a post that started in 1855. A statutory post as an independent advisor to government on all medical matters. And the great fun of it is that I get to speak truth to power, that I have to speak without fear or expectation of favour to ministers, government, and also talk to the public about public health matters. Um, I'm the 16th, and if this works properly, you'll see that I'm not only the sixth most powerful woman, but I'm the first woman CMO. And in this role, I'm head of the public health profession, as well as leading research for the NHS, um, because I come from a scientific background. Now, one of the ways I get to speak independently as CMO is by publishing an annual report, which is totally independent. It's a very public way of sharing the public health agenda. And I speak to the country from this position, and I'm often called the nation's doctor. And I can speak about the annual report and the issues there, or actually about the science. Um, so you will, many of you have heard me talking about mitochondrial transfer and the so-called three-parent families and trying to explain the science underpinning that. Um, I usually front the annual stop smoking campaigns. Um, and this gives me the opportunity to speak about many issues to the public, to health professionals, academics, funders, commissioners, policy makers, and indeed now I'm on the executive board of the World Health Organization to all of them as well. Um, today, for example, I've spoken to the local government association, I've done some filming for the BBC, and here I am. Uh, I'm quoted in the medical press, I write for the medical press, I'm quoted elsewhere, and I've even, on a subject that I am working hard on, antimicrobial resistance, done a TEDx talk. The drugs don't work, and I clearly missed an opportunity because I have a book I could have brought and signed. <laughs> but you can get it on Amazon. It's called The Drugs Don't Work, and it's about antimicrobial resistance published by Penguin, and I don't take the royalties, so I can tell you it's worth a read. My colleagues take the royalties. I do all of this, and I can see that my team gave you a particularly serious picture, top left, and I try and help people understand the issues, not just through using words, but also, as I'm going to show you, through diagrams and pictures, because I think, for me, visualisation is very important. I've got all the public health priorities that you would expect, obesity, physical activity, and my most recent call to the nation was to take on board the fact that average weight, and I'll come back to this with, a, with an infographic, is now on healthy weight, that we've normalised overweight. We've normalised a sedentary life in this country. Um, and I'm working on alcohol, antimicrobial resistance. So I have the public health priorities, but I also have some that arise out of the annual reports. I've mentioned antimicrobial resistance. And I have to, on behalf of all of us, respond to sudden issues. And the obvious one is horse meat. And many of you will remember that I had to explain that even if you had eaten horse meat, it wasn't going to harm you. I've eaten horse meat knowingly. It, it's perfectly reasonable. And if it was contaminated with phenylbutazone, you would need to eat five or 600 big horse burgers to get a single human dose. And Fergus Walsh of the BBC did this wonderful picture of the five, 600 burgers. 
and it just is so revolting, you quite understand. You could never eat enough to get a human dose. <laughs> An issue that's arising that I'm very concerned about are e-cigarettes and vaping, and we could talk about how marketing is being used by tobacco companies and e-cigarette companies for that. But let me go back to the annual reports, because that's where I'm using visuals. We've got the CMO annual reports going back to 1877, so a long time, and there's been one every year except during the Second World War when there was just one report for the whole of the Second World War, and in 2010 when I was appointed for a year as interim and not as a substantive CMO. And I've chosen to do my report quite differently. I'm doing two volumes each year. One volume is about the health of the nation and its surveillance. And I'm going to show you some of that. And the example in the exhibition comes from one of these. And one of the important things about this is collecting a lot of data, actually for public health people to use, but of interest to all of us. How do you show it so that it matters to people and it means something? And then making sure that behind it, all that data is available by local authority so that people can use it themselves and reuse it, because I think that's very important, that transparency. So a surveillance volume each year. And then each year I've chosen to do a deep dive, as I call it, an in-depth review of a subject, getting in the scientific experts who write the chapters, tell me what this means, and then I write with the chief editor the policy implications of that. Um, and I have to find different ways of doing it. And it was that first one on infection, which I thought was going to be totally non-controversial, I should tell you, but went from the NHS to the community and impacts on all of us, when all these experts said, but antimicrobial resistance is a problem. And I realised the experts hadn't got a voice. And as someone said to me at an international meeting recently, I changed from being chief medical officer to being chief marketing officer around antimicrobial resistance. And one of the problems I want to show you in this diagram, we've coped with antimicrobial resistance, antibiotic resistance, very easily in the past. It's natural selection. It happens very easily because we had a golden age of discovery. But what you see in this, is, and this comes from Davos, the World Economic Forum, is that we were making new antibiotics right through there till 1987. And since then, we've had no new antibiotic families. Now, I think this is a useful infographic, but it didn't, to me, have the strength I needed to get this issue over. So we redid it in this way to try and make it a prominent issue. I have to say that the Prime Minister called me in a month ago to discuss it, and he's now got it on his agenda, as will begin to be clear. So this was me taking graphics from other people and working with my team to try and make the real concern, because this is like climate change, if we don't get new antibiotics, we'll die of antibiotic resistance before climate change hits us, and we're doing it to ourselves. So I thought that that was better to make it clear. And in that report, we used some very nice infographics, and this was one that actually the British Medical Journal used a year ago, March 2013, as picture of the week. And what is important here is to show you this section of 36% that are infections in the blood of something called E. coli. And, and there's a lot more than we knew until we put it together in this way. And the important thing is that 30% um, of E. coli septicemia patients die if you have antibiotic resistance and only 15% if you don't. That models out at 5,000 people dying in this country every year of antibiotic resistance, of their E. coli infections. And that's much bigger than the deaths of MRSA, C. difficile. But by putting it on this um, circle in that way, there's probably a proper name for this, 
um, we, we drew it to people's attention and made much more of it. I've got another example to show you here, out of the same volume. Our chief editor, Tom Fowler, is here, and he, he pulled it all together. And this is about liver disease, and it got a lot of attention because the black line, this line, is England. And these are mortality, so deaths, rising due to liver disease. Now, liver disease causing deaths is caused either by alcohol or obesity or undiagnosed viral infections, almost entirely. You can get Wilson's disease and things, but they're very few. So they're all preventable. Yet, look at that going up. And the red line is the EU15, the, the one countries you'd want to compare us with, coming down. This really demonstrated to everyone that we were going the wrong way compared with everyone else. So by using this, we were able to demonstrate we have a problem with liver disease, predominantly actually alcohol. It clearly takes time um, to sort, and I wanted to use a lot of different ways of looking at things in my report. One of the things we did use was not just, I've clearly got to click it again, standard maps, which I've learnt to call chloropleths. Did I say that right? Chloropleths, where the size of the map relates to the geographical size, but we've used with input from Danny Dawling, the social geographer up in Sheffield, who's fantastic, he provided the files to help us do this, cartograms. And here, what you see is the size relates to the population. So you're getting on this, not just geography, but the issue and the population size. I think they're terrifically powerful. Um, and if we go to the next one, which is one of the ones that we used in that particular annual report, what it actually shows is good news, that people who live the longest spend the shortest amount of time living with long-term disability or illness. And so it really is a myth that increasing longevity means people will spend more of their life in ill health. But inequality is evident. Now, Tom Fowler, who's the chief editor here in the audience, added to these um, cartograms, and he added two things. He added this histogram, so you can see the distribution of the issue and the problem, and we made sure that dark was always bad and pale good. And then he added red edges to local authority areas, I'm losing this, like this, where there's signi statistical significance. So dark surrounded by red, and it's really bad news. Have I got that right, Tom? Good. They have to train me well. Um, and by using these different ways of showing things, we hope to draw people in and to get them thinking about the issues. I think the great thing about these cartograms is that they allow you to build hypotheses that you can then explore and think about and debate. And I think, I do think that they are fantastic the way they are. This one is an obesity one, um, showing you the prevalence among reception year children. I think, for me, the interest is putting that next door to um, children going into secondary school and seeing they go in with 9% overweight or obese, and they move into secondary school with double that overweight. And what you, can, but what you see here is obesity differs with geographic location. We could show you ones about gender and age group, deprivation, ethnicity. So, you know, we can begin to tease things out. It was only when I got the whole report and looked at it that I realised how badly we were doing for the public in the northwest, the northeast, and Cornwall. I mean, there are bits of London too, but it really brings it home to you by using these. 
And here we've got the proportion of population on the left, aged over 16, who report abstaining from alcohol. And then on the right, the proportion of drinking population who engage in higher risk drinking. So you can compare, are the same places abstaining? And my geography is very bad, so I'm not even going to guess where that is. But look, a high proportion abstaining and over drinking. Mm -hmm. And that leads you to wonder whether they're directly related. But you can see other areas where they're not the same. That area there, there's much less over drinking and more abstaining. So you can begin to think what's going on. It doesn't tell you what is. It makes you think about it. So you can test it by looking at the data or asking questions. I used infographics. This is one from my infections report. And it, it's actually quite complex. When they did it for me, I had to spend quite a bit of time looking at it. But um, it, it begins to tease out which are the important infections, where have they come from, are they imported, do they relate to a travel history or, or not, things like that. Um, quite important at the moment, um, malaria, but what with the Ebola going on, here's another hemorrhagic fever, dengue. I was horrified to know that in that year we'd had 294 cases of dengue uh, coming in, and you can see some of these other issues there. We're all very concerned about TB, and I should know where it is on there, but I've lost it, so. Uh, but TB is on there and is, is an issue. So it begins to show you things around be hospital bed days used, less than 1% of hospital bed days for infection, but if we don't sort out the antibiotic resistance, that'll go up, and age of death will come down and to explore the issue about foreign travel and staying abroad. The final one I want to show you is our latest report, and the chief editor for this experimented with more user-friendly images for the layman, and the left-hand one is around obesity. Of every 100 adults in England, two are pathologically underweight, look at the number that are obese and overweight, and it is therefore a minority who are a reasonable, healthy weight. And this side is around what's the most you drank um, in one night last week, and isn't it a good thing that 40%, um, I don't know how they managed it, didn't drink last <laughs> week at all. <laughs> Since I know the literature, I drink much less than I ever did, and I'm within the CMO guidelines on alcohol consumption. <laughs> I want you to know. But drinking nothing in a week, is, I can't remember when I did that. Um, oh, dear. I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, about a third drink within the recommended limit, and there's that third that I worry about, which is more than the recommended limit. And we've got some groups at the moment looking at the evidence base for what is safe to drink and reasonable to drink. And they're working now with other people, including David's going to have a look at it. What's the best way of communicating this to people? Because, you know, it's one thing me haranguing people and saying, you shouldn't over drink. But we all know that will have no impact. How do we get people to understand what's in their interests? How do we make a difference for them so that they don't damage their health, but we don't stop them enjoying life. And those are the kind of questions that we need to ask. And I think visualization of the data helps us move that forwards. So I do want to thank the British Library. I thought it was an absolutely lovely exhibition. I really enjoyed going round it. I'm going to go round again before it closes. Um, I learned a lot from it, and I hope you've all enjoyed it too. Thank you. Sally, just before we hand over to David, you said at one point, uh, made this point about being the, market, the chief marketeer. Are you selling an opinion or are you presenting data? Oh, interesting. Um, I'm presenting data, but I am selling to governments around the world that if they don't take action, 
in my opinion, they are heading for a doomsday scenario. And, and with the report, who is your audience? Is it the public? Is it politicians? Is it doctors? Who, who are you primarily thinking of when you construct those graphics? Uh, they're aimed at the doctors, be they public health community or the people in the, in the NHS, and the politicians. So they have to be intelligible to politicians or I'm not doing my job, which is advising government and politicians. So my most recent one was on children um, and looking at the return on investment for um, taking early action um, to prevent ill health or, or, or problems. And I was so shocked by the data that we got from the scientists that I called it, uh, our children deserve better. So I do have an advocacy role and I am allowed an opinion, but I try very hard to make sure my opinion is based on fact and scientific evidence and that there's a, scient a few scientists who'd stand up and say, thank you, she's right, we gave her that data. Okay, I'm sure we'll come back to this. David, <laughs> do, you, do you want to show us how you think it looks from the point of view of the, the citizen, the, the, the consumer of information, the public? Yes, yeah, so I've got um, a slightly different perspective on this, um, which I hope if Sally hasn't messed up my stuff completely, <laughs> I can make work. Okay, yeah. I, I'm interested in, in the stories that are told on the basis of the kind of public health data that Sally has a, at her fingertips. So I'm interested in what it means to you, how it's communicated to you by the media or how by anybody else. So um, this is my starting point. Are the, are the sort of stuff that the Daily Express will feature in this. I, I, I So <laughs> brace yourselves for the Daily Express. Um, you know, this sort of stuff. Daily fright boosts cancer risk by 20%. So what this says... Yeah, this is some epidemiological research showing that uh, consumption of processed meat, 50 grams per day, increases your cancer risk by 20%. In fact, um, the EPIC group in, in, uh, in Europe um, have just released a new paper showing, again reinforcing this, that in fact it looks like um, uh, a daily 50 grams of processed meat, that's uh, about three rashes of bacon or a large floppy sausage, that's about that, that's about increases your annual risk of mortality by about 18% what's known as the hazard ratio. So this is, these are, for processed meat at least, there's fairly strong evidence now. How is that communicated? Now, that's what's called a relative risk communication. It just tells you, but, you know, what does it mean? Do, do I worry? Do I care? Um, and so th there's the, the, uh, a lot of research has been shown that, that this relative risk communication actually exaggerates the magnitude of the effect of something. And it's generally considered that the way in which these things should be communicated for a transparent communication to allow uh, an honest uh, appraisal of the evidence by individuals should be in terms of absolute risks. What does it mean to perhaps 100 people like you? So we could ask, what does it mean for me? Okay, just giving people, we'll come back to that, to the example in a moment. Just giving people info unlikely to, is unlikely to have much impact on behavior, as, as Sally said. It's just telling them, you know, what what's going to happen um, is known is not going to change people's behavior very much. But I, I do believe it's actually necessary, if only ethically, to provide that information. It's a necessary but not a sufficient condition. We'll get back to behavior change later, I'm sure. Relative risks are misleading, you know, or at least they exaggerate the importance. And the, the other way to communicate this, which is the classic public health way to say, oh, you know, 10,000 people a, a year will die of X, or 5,000 people in the country will die of X, is actually, I think, completely inappropriate and irrelevant to communicating to an individual. It's extremely relevant to communicating to a profession and to policymakers. But for me, what do I care? I, would, I care about what does it mean for me? Okay, so the standard way in which it's recommended to communicate this kind of thing now, and which is being taken up by many organizations, is to say, what does it mean to 100 people? We saw that in Sally's um, little uh, similar sort of icon arrays in Sally's communications. So for this, 400 people, uh, I should say that this is particularly, this study was about pancreatic cancer, which is an extremely nasty cancer, um, very horrible indeed, but fortunately only affects one in 80 of the population. So let's say 400 people, I'm sure like you, who sit down to your nice, healthy, smug, middle-class breakfast of muesli and nut, <laughs> fruit, um, sadly still, 400, five will get pancreatic cancer during their lifetime, sadly. So let's compare it with 400 complete slobs who sit down every morning to a great big greasy three rasher bacon sandwich. That's how many will get pancreatic cancer according to this study. So did you notice the difference? Sorry. That's the difference. Because that's the 20% increase over one in 80 chance. One in 400. 
400 people are going to stuff that down their gob every day of their lives in order to get one extra case of pancreatic cancer. Now, put like this, it doesn't look so impressive at all. And it's well known that it doesn't look that impressive. However, this is now considered the sort of standard way in which one should communicate. And I'd like to show some examples of where this is being put into practice. And the first example I'd like to show is, is the new breast cancer screening leaflets. I was on the committee that drew these up. And uh, these are staggeringly innovative. It's the first, I think, in the world to take the approach that's being taken. It's basically based on, the, on uh, to, trying to take a non-paternalistic approach. It says to a woman, consider the offer of having breast screening. Here is the information, here is the evidence about the pros and cons. And it's explained in a particular way, I'll show it in a moment. And it doesn't make a recommendation. And same for cervix and bowel cancer, the new leaflets do not recommend that you have screening. This is an amazing innovation, and we still don't know quite what the effect will be. The, um, can the breast cancer attendance rates have dropped slightly over the next few, last few years, but this is before the leaflets come in, They're very slightly. So we, we, as it's not known what the effect of this much more transparent, open effect might be. Now, um, this, the information was based on an evidence review commissioned by the Mike Richards, the cancer czar, and uh, various methods of communication were tested. I, I, I was one of the presenters to a citizen's jury. Very good engagement with the public about what they understood. And they've been taken up by, for example, Breakthrough Breast Cancer UK, which we recently won an award for the communication of, um, uh, bre about breast screening on their website. I recommend going to it. It's a very interesting, multi-layered website where you can say, would you like to know more? Would you like to know more? And so, for example, their infographic for explaining um, uh, breast screening um, is, is this one. Um, I'll show a different one in a moment. So don't, you know, don't, this is one way of doing it. Here's another. So this is 200 women who don't attend breast screening. Over 20 years, they say 12 will be diagnosed with breast cancer, um, eight will be treated and survive, and four, sadly, will, will die of their breast cancer. So that's four out of 200 over between, actually between 50 and 80. For 200 women going for screening, 15 will be diagnosed with breast cancer, three more. 12 will be treated and survive. You know, a very good survival rate, 80% um, survival rate. Three, sadly, will die early from their breast cancer. Okay, so what's the difference of the experience of those 200 women from that side or that side? In this group, one more has died from their breast cancer compared with that. In this group, the group went for screening, three have been overtreated. They've been tr diagnosed and treated for a cancer that would not have affected them, and they wouldn't have even known they had it if they hadn't gone for breast screening. What that corresponds to in terms of numbers is that over the year in the UK, 1,300 women essentially have their lives saved or early deaths prevented from the screening program at the cost of 4,000 women being treated totally unnecessarily. Okay, so that's the facts, and that's what's gone into the new screening leaflet, that the, the three and the one being the balance of the harms and benefits. Here's an alternative graphic, infographic. Instead of an icon array, it's a frequency tree saying exactly the same thing. This is 200 women who attend screening, 15 will develop breast cancer, 12 treated and survive, three die from breast cancer. 200 women not going for screening. Again, here we have the 15 all develop breast cancer, but three are unaffected, four die from breast cancer. So two alternative graphics. Um, the the um, uh, citizens jury got presented with both of these and actually they, you know, they understood them. They actually like the table as well, just for the numbers. And they like the frequency trees. I like frequency trees quite like. You don't, have, you don't see the full 200, so you don't quite get the impression this is actually very low numbers of people who are either benefit or harmed, but um, it's there. Now, um, one of the tragedies <laughs> is that neither of these graphics ended up going into the leaflet. Uh, to which I shall now bang my head against the wall. They were in, they, you know, we were dithering around for ages, and they were in it till almost the last draft, and they got taken out. Um, because they, they tested on some women, and they said, oh, I don't understand that. Because you look at that, if you're on your own, and you're not very numerate, and you look at that, that's quite difficult to understand. People find it difficult to understand. So it's something I'd like to, I, I believe, though, there is a numeracy paradox in this kind of communication. Because um, what happens is that the leaflets are designed for people with a reading age of 11 and a numeracy of probably even less. However, those people, there's increasing um, uh, evidence that these are the people who do not particularly want to engage with shared care, informed choice, you know, reading the leaflets. The leaflets are designed for people who don't want to read the leaflets. That's the case with health information at the moment. And I think it's a real paradox. I think we need to go into multiple levels of explanation. I was pleading, let's have two pages at the back in small print so people who wanted to know more. 
So I think the websites, again, can do this multi-level. The crucial thing that's been shown in psychological research and communication is that one size does not fit all. You can have something attractive, but for people who really engage with it, it needs to be geared up to their levels and engage for interest and numeracy. Okay, next example. Chronic risks, this sort of stuff. I don't know about you, this is my favorite, this is my idea of a meal out. Uh, I, lo I love this sort of stuff. I also, unlike Sally, I couldn't care less what people do. People can eat and drink and smoke themselves to an early grave. Couldn't care less, that's not part of my job. Um, but I do believe they should sort of know the consequences. And at the moment, they're badly served. So for example, Daily Express again. Fancy that. You know, it says, eat more, eat less meat, more veg. It's a secret of a longer life. I'm trying to eat less meat and more veg. But they say things like, if people cut down the amount of red meat they eat to less than half a serving a day, 10% of all deaths could be avoided. Whoa, isn't that amazing? Why don't you have that in your graphic? That would really convince people. Really. <laughs> It's a, I mean, isn't statistics wonderful? So this is not great, and it's not very honest. What it means about the, what, how, what epidemiologists show is that changing your behavior or, or different behaviors lead to different annual risks of death. And what they're always referring to is what's known as the hazard curve. This is known, also known as the force of mortality. That is a great graphic. This is on a log scale. So actually what this shows, this is the chance of not living to your next birthday. So um, for me, I'm 60. Uh, it's about 1% not living to the next birthday, on average. So one, one out of 160-year-olds does not reach 61. Um, you get up to one in 10 by the time you're about 83. Um, it's about one in 1,000 for 30-year-olds, and one in 10,000 for seven-year-olds. No, nobody has ever been safer ever in the whole history of humanity than a seven-year-old at the moment in, in this country. One in, only one in 10,000 will not make their eighth birthday. This, sadly, is the bulge of risk-taking youth. Um, it's a really, really sad. Very serious, and so, so how can we use this? How can we sort of communicate something with, with this? Let's see, we've got an animation of this. So for example, that's men and that's women. So women are um, lower than men at every single age, lower risk. But we cannot, and what, the, the reason why this is so, it's so fundamental is that um, behaviors move this up or down. It's what's known as the hazard ratio. That's what epidemiologists calculate. A pro 50 grams of processed meat is a hazard ratio of 1.8. 1.18, it moves this up by 20%. What's the interesting fact, is that one I really like, is the fact that Gomperts in 1825, record, you, you must have got down like this. The curve didn't look that much different 200 years ago, except it was way up, but it's still in the same basic shape. He got down here and he realized, my God, that's a straight line. It's a straight line, apart from idiotic youth, there's, a, um, there's something about our bodies that between 7 and 90 makes them die at the same increased rate, 9% per year. Every year we get older, it's a 9% increased risk of dying. It's like, it's like compound interest, great rate of interest, fantastic. It doubles every eight years. So every eight years, your chance of dying before your next birthday doubles, roughly. Uh, amazing in compound interest. So, and that's just a fact of it's 9%. Men, women, 9%, that's it. So, Every year you get older is associated with a hazard ratio of 1.09. Of so another way we can think about this, a metaphor we can use, is that this bacon sandwich with a hazard ratio of 1.18 is like being two years older. If you stuff your gob with 50 grams of processed meat every day, you're making yourself two years older. You're affecting your age. So, and uh, a couple of cigarettes, that's, um, uh, that's a year older. Um, you know, you have uh, you know, a couple of extra drinks, you're making yourself another year older. Two hours of sedentary behavior a day. Down to Abbey Christmas special, another year older you are by that, <laughs> what you do. So just be, just be warned. Now, so that's now taken up by this idea of heart age, which I'd like to come on to. It's something to do with premature aging. You're making yourself getting older faster than you, than you need be. And who wants to be older, apart from some teenage girls perhaps? People do not want to be older than they are. So that's being used as a form of communication, telling people how old their heart is, how old their lungs are been shown to be help giving up smoking. But you can also show survival curves. This is the proportion of people, women, um, who will be alive at a particular age. Yeah, I and mean, this is assuming, given that everything carries on the same. Of course, it doesn't carry on the same because if we look at life expectancy, it was 82 in 2006, it's been going up at three months a year, not just for the last 25 years, but about the last 50 years. And although it's some signs of slowing down, I believe, I think some, it's still going on. So every year we only age nine months. If you, Go forward, and we go back again. Very nice. All that public health stuff. All those drains. That's what, well, it was, that's what it was a few years ago. No, I don't think drains are much of it. But, um, so three months every year. Um, 
So how can, we, but how can we then change our life expectancy? So another way of looking at it is to go on to behaviours. Um, hang on. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, I know. This is my screen is not working. Whoa. What, how does changing your behaviour change your survival? Hang on. This is not working. I think I'm going to have to give this one up. Is this going to full screen? Is this going to work? No. Okay, sorry, it doesn't come over on the thing. Well, basically, what this does is, that I'm gonna, what I was going to show is that if you smoke and everything like this, this goes up or down. You know, it moves. So, but these ideas, have been, just like to finish off by saying that these ideas have been now implemented in a calculator, which is now generally available to anyone who wants to use it and the JBS3 calculator. And um, I want to push this slightly because, again, my team created this calculator. It's now available online, and a little plug, hopefully, with the help of NHS England, it might go into every general practice. It could anyway, anyone. It's just available online. This was done with the Joint British Societies, the British Cardiovascular Society, all these societies. And basically, the idea is that you can put in your factors, you know, based on huge public health um, studies, and find out about your risks of cardiovascular disease. So let's say um, uh, 74, I'm, I'm going to put myself in, but a male, um, he's 40 or so, and he uh, smokes, and uh, his cholesterol's, you know, a bit high, and, um, oh, let's put his blood pressure up. Yeah, goodness <laughs> me. And let's make him fat. Goodness me, yeah, yeah, let's bring it on. That's what we say, yeah. Okay, so, so let's, see what, let's see what state he's 40. Okay, so let's go. He hasn't got any family history or anything like that. So he says his heart age is about 48. So his heart is about 10 years older than he is because of his behaviour. What this means is that this is the, he's got the same risks, annual risks, um, of a heart attack as someone who is 48 and who has, who's got better habits. Heart age, so that, this is to do with premature ageing with aging yourself, using that metaphor. There's other metaphors you could use. You could use, this is the metaphor that says, how long do you want to, you know, do you want to see your, see your grandchildren? How long are you going to go before you have your first heart attack or stroke, before you expect to have your first heart attack or stroke? On the thwanta. What's the chance of getting to the next 10 years without a heart attack or stroke, with a heart attack, heart attack or stroke? And then, we, we, we're tentative about this, but actually we put in a survival analysis. This is your chance of surviving without a heart attack or stroke at the moment, and which plummets, you know, you're here, and it's plummeting down like that. But look, look if you, you know, were a good boy and, uh, you know, maybe got, brought your blood pressure down. What if you took your statin and did that? Even though you're only 48, brought and did that. You might get your HDL up as well. But what you're... Of course, you, what you damn well should do is stop bloody well smoking. Because <laughs> you, know, you go, wham, you're real bang for your buck there. You get the smoking. But even if you don't want to do stoking, you can do quite a lot with behavior and, um, and, and drugs. So that's a very strong visual image that we design, but the clinicians like it, and the people who test it out on like it as well. It's actually mathematically true. What's nice is that this area here really is your increased number of years before you expect to have a heart attack or stroke. You know, it's mathematically correct and visually, visually powerful. Um, but then we, in, 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 in uh, the spirit of one size does, you know, does not fit all, we then, possibly slightly over the top, put in every damn bit of communication device we could think of. You like little smiley faces, you can have little smiley faces. So um, you can show that if you want to, this is 100 people like you in, uh, by age 50, uh, one will be dead of something else, one will have had a heart attack or stroke, but four people like you would have had a heart attack or stroke, um, but they won't have now because you've, um, because you've taken your interventions. But if you don't stop smoking, then um, that goes back. And if you don't stop smoking, a good chance, you're, a much more increased chance you'll die of something else anyway in the meantime. So all that comes up, comes up there. I, the smileys, some people like the smileys, I quite like icon arrays. I like looking at 100 people like you. you know, this is just like the screening, just like say, this is if you carry on as usual, this is if you start being a good boy. This is what's going to happen to those people. You know, in 10 years' time, or well, let's make it 20 years. Go on, let's give it a, um, let's make it 20 years. Yeah. So this is how many will be living without a heart attack or stroke. This will have had a heart attack or stroke, and these will have died before something else. But this is the reduction if you, if you intervene. Oh, you haven't stopped smoking. Come on, stop smoking. Get a grip, man. Boom. So now you see, and now, but that's maybe a bit difficult to compare. So if you take the difference, though, 
you can then see very powerfully in a different diagram that these people who, who um, would have been um, either had a heart attack or stroke or died are now going to be um, you know, bouncing around like young fawns. So that's, um, so that's 100, 100 people like you. So the, um, these images, some of the, the various representations have been tested out, not by us, but by psychologists in uh, randomized trials to show the impact they have on people been strongly suggested that people with low numeracy with good explanation um, can grasp these. these. This tool is not particularly supposed to be used directly by the patients, although they can. It's supposed to be a three-way device between the doctor and the patient. Okay, so that's the kind of thing I think is um, really quite exciting at the moment. So um, just for a final metaphor, um, okay, here's, I, I, this is storytelling. This is storytelling. These risks, risks don't really exist, I don't believe. You know, this is stories, different images. Um, the story of living longer might not be very attractive because, you know, who wants to have another year being old and dribbly? But the, but the, um, the story of aging faster might be more gripping because we don't want to get older quicker. So, for example, I went to my GP. I've got about a 12% chance of a heart attack or stroke at the moment over the next 10 years. There's one in a million chance I will have it in the next hour. So... Um, <laughs> Got some doctors. <laughs> Sally, can you remember what to do? <laughs> I'm relying on you. Um, so I could take, provided I live that long, I take the stat and reduce 33%. So the standard icon array for that would be 100 people like me, and uh, in 10 years' time, 12 of them will have a heart attack or stroke. Um, but if they all take their statins like good people for the whole 10 years, and they don't mind about any side effects, or they change their statin to reduce the side effects, um, that many, four, will have their heart attack or stroke prevented. So actually that means a number needed to treat 25 people like me would have to take a tablet every day for 10 years to prevent one heart attack or stroke. Okay, well, maybe I do, maybe I don't want to take it. There is another metaphor, because this is 100 people like me, and it's been shown that some people can actually distance themselves. Oh, I'm one of those. You know, I'm a lucky one, or um, you know, there aren't 100 people like me, which is true. So another way to think about it is, what happens is 100 futures for me, 100 ways things might turn out for me. Not 100 people, other people. I don't know what's going to happen in my future. You think all these futures are disappearing off. In how many of them will I have a heart attack or stroke? So, the, of course, the right image for that is to really personalize. <laughs> now, this is really personalized medicine. You wait. You wait. In the, you, can use your web, you can use your webcam and take a picture. You can be an integral part of your risk communication. So there's 100 people like me, and this is what happens. It's even better if you scatter them around, you get a much more better impression of the fact that my future is equivalent, essentially equivalent to throwing a dart over my shoulder, and which one I hit is, is the luck or the draw. It's been shown again in randomized trials that scattering the icons increases the um, feeling of unpredictability. Actually, very valuable. It makes them more difficult to count, but much better, much better at communicating the essential unpredictability about the future. And with that, I shall stop. Thank you very much. David, there's a terrific temptation to suggest that aggregated risks, which are really averages, apply to you personally, so, or apply to an individual personally, so that when we say that sitting down and watching Downton Abbey every day yeah. is two hours or whatever off your life, that or something like half that. Half an hour per day off half, an, half an hour per day. Yeah. Um, apart from it, the two it, hours wasted watching it. Apart from the hours wasted yeah. watching it. <laughs> wasted? Uh, <laughs> But it isn't. That's an no, aggregate no, effect exactly. for an average population, yeah. not for an individual. No. It's simply a probability which might apply or might not to an individual. And you'll never know. And you'll never know if you're that individual. Well, you'll never know the effect of watching Downton Abbey. Right. And um, just as actually, strictly speaking, you don't even know the effect of smoking. You know, you may possibly have got lung cancer anyway. Pretty unlikely. So do you, is there still scope for confusion there, that people will think oh. this is a literal read yeah, up for yeah. my own prospects? Yeah, whereas yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, this is the problem with, with, what, with what honesty, I mean, all these are associations as well, but that generally the, you know, we're not sure, apart from this giving up smoking, we're very good evidence, you know, changing diet or something like that. Well, you know, the actual evidence, that, for, you know, of your health of changing diet as an intervention is quite limited. You know, these are generally population associations. We've we, got, what, half a million people in the EPIC study or something like that? Yeah, but they, 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 they haven't, they haven't are... done had an intervention. Yes, we, know, we can compare groups of people. That's why in the screening one, we try to say these, 200, these are 200 other people. They aren't the same people who went, 
who went there. So, but of course, that nuance, which I try to keep to, does get lost, and that people are interested. What will be the effect on me? My of next this, drink, yes, my yeah, next drink. Of my next something. drink, of, my, of this cigarette. And, and that, of course, is actually impossible. For a start, it is, it is impossible to know. It's, it's not even, I don't think it even exists as a phenomenon. You know, because risk doesn't exist. I don't think it's something you can go out in the world and you can't even theoretically measure it, I don't think, what the effect would be. So you have to use these analogies and metaphors about you know, large groups essentially making an analogy. With, it's as if you were doing something that did have this, but it's not saying it did have this effect. So I know and all, that, will get, that gets lost, of course. Well, we know for the heart ones, we do know, because the effect on reducing blood pressure and cholesterol are shown in randomised trials of, of statins right. and blood pressure reducing drugs. So those heart ones are, and the effect of stopping smoking, are, are evidence based. This should be the effect on you on your risk of doing this. Sally, how do you deal with the problem of all the caveats and the qualifications and the, of the sort David's just been describing? Because, you know, you're communicating to the public. There might be this argument that we do need the numeracy age of eight in order for this thing to give, reach everybody. But um, what does that mean? I mean, does that, you, clearly you can't put all the confidence intervals and all the rest of it oh, around you your data into the main report. I've, uh, well, in the you? main report... Can you? I don't know. Yeah, in our main report, the um, scientists, clinical scientists, do put all that nuance. In the policy chapter, I don't, because I can't. I'm talking to politicians... And I'm talking um, to about what needs to be done policy-wise. And, and around the visualisations? And you, you have to simplify. Yeah. I mean, I, as a doctor with patients, I had to simplify. You know, if you take this treatment, the odds of you recovering are this, or the likelihood, you know, 80% do respond to this treatment, 20% die of the die despite taking this treatment. You have to find ways where people can relate to it in some form, and it's simple. Um, of course, when it's about individual treatment, you often end up with, well, what would you advise, doctor? And then you have a different discussion, uh, because that brings in what are their attitudes to life and, and the quality of life and things. But I think on population health, when we're advising, it is. Um, you try and simplify these randomised controlled trials and get people to live as healthily as possible. But I still remember, as a young doctor, saying... I was told off by my consultant, saying to a patient who was dying of lung cancer, um, you're not supposed to smoke, but it's not going to do you any more harm. <laughs> so right. that's where you could go and do it. Okay. Said you're supposed to stop them all smoking. I said, well, you know, the, the, what good? Just, just one more, one more, <laughs> one more general question, and then we'll open open it out because there's a there's a question of trust here. You know, some people I might respond by saying, well, you, you know, you've you've not been quite full and frank. You've not told me the whole truth here. And and a related point really that visualization because it's so compelling. It's, it's almost vis visceral, mm -hmm. visual, yeah. you know, it's visceral. It, you can get to the point where, well, as, uh, as, as Tim Harford has said, you know, misinformation is beautiful too. Or that, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the problem with the most accomplished information design can be the most convincing lie. Mm. So this is a slight danger that by simplifying and by the colour and the energy and the vividness of all this kind of thing, there's both the potential for people to be more mischievous and the potential for people to feel they're being slightly sold something on an incomplete basis. Well, there's some very interesting stuff that's starting to be written about the ethics of information design. The fact that, um, that, that, that there's, you know, people want to arouse a certain amount of emotion, but not too much, and certainly not to do it in a misleading way. So I think, they, I, I mentioned the word ethics, I think there's an ethics coming to this very strongly indeed about what you're trying to do. This is supposed to be transparent communication to allow people to better exercise their feelings and their judgments and their attitudes in a way that isn't manipulative. And we know I can make a number look big, I can make it look small. You know, anyone you can do that just by changing the colour, you can do all sorts of things. Putting things on a log scale, you can just change everything. Um, so I, I think this is a, a strongly eth where ethics come very strongly into it. And your attitude to risk. So if you take the breast cancer one, and you said to me, you've got a small lump on mammography, you know, we, we might find, if, if we don't treat you, that it's nothing. 
and so you would have had treatment, but if, you, if it is something, you're more likely to survive. I would opt for the treatment on the grounds that better to, A, to have the treatment in case, but also I would take that treatment in the hope of saving other women if that happened as well, as a solidarity issue, that there are two things at play there. One is it might save my life, but even if it doesn't save my life, it may save another woman's life. So there are value judgments personal yes, to you about yes, the way that you're no, going to interpret that's, this. Yeah. The, 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 that's very interesting because I t tend to, usually if someone picks me up from the audience when I'm talking about this stuff, saying, you're being completely individualistic, what about vaccines? where you're making a decision not yeah. just on, on yeah, your half, behalf or your child behalf, well. but about something about... Because of herd immunity society. and so on. Yeah, yeah. because you, can, you mm. can be a free rider if you, if you, if you want to be. And um, so, the, again, this is you know, very different. Where I, I, you know, I was communicating about vaccine risk. I would say it's quite reasonable not to treat it just as an individual level, but to treat it as a societal issue. Do, do either of you think that we're in any danger of making the same old statistical mistakes just prettier? <laughs> I, I, no, I don't. We, of course, you can, and people can manipulate. But I think the sort of stuff that we've been talking about is a major step forward because there is, you know, it's to do with transparency. It's to do with, in a way, telling stories and trying not to be misleading. And it's, it, it's to do with, it, it's using, in a way, it's also using metaphors and images that have, are tested on that are that can be empirically tested to see what their impact is and how they're and how they're seen. And, and so, for example, in terms of the framing, the, the idea of looking at the whole experience of 100 people tries to get away from the idea of just concentrating on the bad or just concentrating on the good. So, for example, you know, the framing in, in the US, they always talk about mortality rates for heart surgery, which are 2%. In the UK, we, we say our surgeons have got 98% survival rates which is much better, of course. <laughs> so our surgeons are hugely better. And, um, and that's, you know, that is done. That's the, that's the different framing that's done in the two different countries. And, of course, what we really should really be doing to somebody is saying, well, out of 100 people like you, two will die and 98 will survive. Even the order in which you put them can have an effect and certainly the colour you use in the graphics can have an effect. But essentially that is the story you should be trying to communicate. The uniform reporting of harms and benefits is the sort of, that's the mantra I keep on buzzing around my head whenever I see anything. Is this doing uniform? reporting of harms and benefits. Okay. So I think we need transparency, and I, I like this, and it's what we should do, but I fully recognise that as we give people more transparency, there's less paternalism in the system, maybe maternalism, and that we may have less of a take-up of either screening or something else, but that that's the risk we have to take. David, you I was just going to say, you know, that's something that you know, obviously will be empirically tested. But yeah. um, I mean, the other thing is that the, I think it's very reasonable and, and something I, I hear again from my clinical colleagues is repeated that when people are presented with transparent information, a very common response is, thank you so much. I'm really glad you showed me that. Now, what do you think I should yeah. do? Which is the, <laughs> a, a or what would you do with your wife or your family? Or what yeah. would you do? And I think it's completely, I have that, I, that's how I respond as well. I think it's completely reasonable because it's, it's, a, it's a sort of, you know, it's uh, um, something which is, is honest and fair, and but it engenders uh, trust. Your, your the clinician is showing, you know, trustworthiness, and then the patient then says, would, mm. would like to have their advice. Completely fair. I don't think that's paternalistic. Mm. No, that's being, I, I think that's um, that's being helpful. No, that's fine. Well, that's what they think. Yeah, <laughs> they're not, exactly. they're not being paternalistic, are yeah, they? Yeah, no, no. Yeah, um, yeah. Does anybody want to uh, uh, have a question? Do, let's throw it over. Down here at the front here. I, I should start off by saying that for my sins, I, I'm chairman of the Transport Statistics Users Group, so when it comes okay. to statistics, <laughs> I know a little, I'm, I'm not, too, not, 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 too sure, not too sure about that. But I've actually got two comments. The first is, um, are people, not necessarily about medical, actually becoming a bit, a bit cynical about statistics simply because it is used as a weapon by groups? Look at the immigration debate, look at just, just, just about, about anything. My other point is, you talked about statins, which is an interesting thing. Now, I take, uh, so let's say I take 75 milligrams of aspirin to reduce, to reduce my risk of heart attack. That's why I'm also told that it might increase my risk of internal bleeding. Mm -hmm. I'm told there are side effects from taking statins. I mean, you've really heard uh, Inside Health, um, well, the series, always, Mark McCartney is always going on about uh, these are the statistics. I think there are so many factors. When it comes to taking, you know, your bacon or cholesterol, actually isn't so much the cancer we're talking about. I thought it was the risk of cholesterol and everything like 
like that. And it seems to me that you do something, there are so many ways it can affect you, some positively, some negatively. Are you ever going to be able to explain it to me? Because at the end of the day, if I go to the doctors, and I say, I probably know a bit about statistics, but I'm going to say to the doctors, you're the doctor, what do you recommend? Mm. I think that's a very sensible approach. I, think, I mean, the point is that trying to identify the effect of one, you know, bit of behaviour, one sort of thing, is, is really, is very tricky and actually is, is doomed. You can't say, but because, you know, our behaviours are hugely correlated and, uh, there are, and, and trying to identify the effect of one single thing is really tricky indeed. So, I mean, the point is that when you do all this quantification, you end up with, you know, amazingly, you know, new insights like don't smoke, don't drink too much, take some exercise and have a healthy diet. And, and <laughs> Wow! <laughs> so, you know, you, you can ask your doctor, but that's what he'll say. And because we, it's, it's what works. And you can try to look at the relative contribution to these, and smoking sort of dominates very much, but basically that's the cluster of behaviours that is going to, that's going to you know, help the health of you personally and the nation. So um, I think, in a way, you're, you know, statistics being used as a, as a rhetorical device, and um, I, I don't like that, because, of course, I'm very happy to do it myself. Um, and you could say that that's, in fact, what a lot of this, to some extent, is, because in the end, there's some fairly basic rules of behaviour that, that we know it would be a good thing to do. Um, and the statistics, and that's why, actually, I believe, that, as I said right at the beginning, the statistics by themselves are not shouldn't be the main tool of trying to change behaviour and, uh, and because they're ineffective anyway, because people say, another statistic. However, um, you know, if, if communicated in a transparent way and consistently from different people and accompanied crucially by public health interventions that actually change you know, when the, what's in the trade known as the choice architecture, you know, the whole nudge, non-conscious you know, uh, influences on people just make it easier to do a better thing, especially influencing social norms, trying to influence what you feel people around you are doing, then you, might, then you can change behaviour, because behaviour is changing, you know, it does change. Which is really your ultimate objective, isn't it, Sally, to change behaviour? Um, I'd like people to lead healthy lives, yes, so I would but, like... But, but is it to change behaviour or is that up to yes. them? Yes. It is well, to change... Well, no, it, it is up to them, only they can decide to do it, but clearly if we can nudge the public, the population, into healthier behaviour, um, they will benefit and uh, we will spend less in the NHS, which is another advantage. I, I think it's very difficult. Why take physical exercise? The evidence is absolutely clear that sedentary lifestyles are bad for you and physical exercise is good for you. But we have a population that's getting more and more sedentary and we've found it very difficult to find our way through how do you increase physical activity in children, let alone in adults. Do you share some of the scepticism we've heard about the possibility that visualisation is going to be a, an important part of changing people's behaviour? Can it do it? I think it's a, a minor part. I think we're into real That's behavioural interventions, yes. Right. And social marketing. But you need all of this to underpin that so you know that you're doing something that's evidence-based. You're trying to get people to something that they will find pleasant and good that will help them. Okay. This is actually a question to uh, Sally Davis. Uh, all day today we have been discussing um, aging here in this very uh, conference hall and the way we culturally uh, deal with aging populations in the United Kingdom. And I was so surprised that you came out with the increased longevity doesn't mean spending more on healthcare for the elderly because they're not necessarily getting um, more ill health. My question is then, when are we going to convey this message? Is this a new finding or when are we going to convey this message to the many journalists, the many people and, and politicians in this country who demonize the elderly every day? The way we talk about elderly people in this country, in this culture, is the burden on the NHS, the financial burden of the elderly population, the burden of the state pension. I come from a culture where we revere the elderly, but also... 31 years at the bedside of patients, elderly patients working every day with them in the NHS as an immigrant of 31 years. I don't recognize these people who are such a burden on, on, on this economy okay. and this society. All right, thank you very much. Um, just on the aisle there, a couple of rows back. There we go. 
Uh, it's now possible via NHS Choices, although it's not very accessible, um, to find out um, individual data on consultants and uh, surgical outcomes and deaths, but for, only for some specialties. I was wondering, do you think data like this is a good idea to show to the public? Is there data we shouldn't show to the public, and who gets to decide? Okay, David, do you want to take the second one first, the yes, data, yeah, data yeah, on individual surgical I've, performance? I've been involved in. I mean, that's... Yeah, because that's you know, a political innovation to put the individualised thing. I think, um, you know, I like transparency of data. and it, All sorts of surgical data has been available for some time. If you, you can find, you know, success rates for kidney transplant rates, for, um, you know, which the professions are run, for cardiac surgery, for paediatric cardiac surgery, they're all available. Um, I think, um, so I like transparency. It depends, again, on the packaging. I think, you know, for start, individual surgeon is probably... Of not the issue. It's, it's often the unit, it's the post-surgical care, all sorts of things. It means it's not just the surgeon, the named surgeon. So I think that can be very misleading. The other thing, of course, is that from a, as a statistician, it's absolutely crucial to avoid any sort of league tabling because people can be different, but they're not actually significantly different. You know, they're, they're, there's always some variance. People have good, runs of good or bad luck, but on the whole, it doesn't make a difference. Adult cardiac surgery in this country is absolutely staggering. There used to be quite a lot of you know, variability in practice, but then once the profession started really monitoring success rates, risk-adjusted success rates, everybody just came in. I mean, some people would have given up and things like that. So um, you got rid of those, and they all come in. And now, it doesn't seem to make really any difference where you have your bypass graft done in the country. Isn't that a staggering achievement? Absolutely amazing. So, and that was brought about through sharing data and a degree of transparency for it. So I think you know, there is a really good incentive, at least for the profession, knowing that somebody could see these things. So I'm all in favour of transparency, but it's got to be done in an appropriate way, avoiding league tables, avoiding high media attention, um, and using good transparent communication, which I mean, can be done. I, I've seen the photographs of particular surgeons in the paper with their failure rates, yeah. as they've been described, yeah. you know, and, you, uh, and it's pretty hard. I mean, these, these, some of them might have only done six operations or something like that, yeah. and they one, one fatality. Yeah, no, absolutely shocking, unless it's done in a statistically competent way. And there are ways to do it, to avoid league tabling, to avoid ranking. Ranking is absolutely is outrageous and should never be done. Sally, could you tell us about the life expectancy and healthy life expectancy yeah. conundrum? Because yeah. it, it was fascinating to hear yeah, you say it. Well... Uh, that particular bit of data, I'd have to go back to Tom probably to inquire where it came from, um, but we picked it out because we thought it was interesting, it does show that as people get older, there is, we are not... The worry was that as people get older, their ill health would start at the same age and we'd have years more ill health, and that's not actually what we're seeing. We're seeing, uh, for many people, the ill health starting later, and, and so it's not a bad thing to be living older for the NHS costs. I share your concern that we have a culture that doesn't respect the experience and everything of our elders, and I, I hope we'll find ways to get there, but I think they are two separate things. I, this is really important because, as I said, I made the you know, rather crass joke about another year being old and dribbly, but that's, you know is a popular perception. There's a lovely quote by Kingsley Amis who said, you know, I'm not going to give anything up for the sake of another year in a geriatric home in Western Supermare. Because he was assuming that the age he where he went into the home was yeah. fixed and it would just yeah. be another year in the home. Yeah. But if it means delaying by a year, being home, he, I'm sure he might have given it up. And actually, if you look at um, the data with the statins and anti-high high blood pressure treatments and everything, we can put off strokes, we can put off cardiovascular yeah, 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 events, yeah. and people are healthier for longer. Yeah. It is worthwhile. It does make you wonder what that, sort of how attitudes could change if we got yeah. the data presentation That's right. That's a really interesting... I mean, yeah. have, you, have you... I haven't seen a, a presentation of that? No, uh, you'd have to have healthy life expectancy in life. Yeah. And showing that, that as you got older, the margin yeah. of ill health stayed the same width would be it's an incredibly important... Um, we'll give you the data to do it yeah. for. Yeah. <laughs> okay. and, and final thoughts on transparency. Again, this conundrum about whether people are really going to believe you. <laughs> well, I'm not sure it's about whether they'll believe me. I th the issue 
is that we should have transparency. So all the data I use and those diagrams, they're all on the web for people to find them. But then how do you put your message over and you start with, so who are you talking to? And what is the message that will work with them? And you'd, I do simplify. I think we all do if we're trying to get messages over. But I make sure that the data is there for people who want to see the rest of it because it's very important. So whatever the politics surrounding the message you have to it comes back to the hard data in the end. That's yeah. the, as you said earlier, yeah. I think it underpins everything yeah. else. Yeah. I, think, I think it's a very important point that you, know, you do have to simplify stuff. And that's why I do think that, again, for, for, for ethical reasons, one needs to have multi-levels of explanation where people can always go to more if they want to. I'd like to know more. The, the screening leaflet, endless discussions, because there's three and the one. They're somewhere around there. And in the end, it, they got labelled. You know, some people want to put intervals on them. and well, No, 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 it's too much. In the end, they, they, I think it's been, they, they're given qualitative labels as being the best current judgments. So um, right. thre um, three levels of qualification. They're, they're provisional, they're judgments, and they're as good as we can do. They're only as good as we can do. So, and that's what they're labelled as, which I thought was, after three hours of discussion, that's <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't a bad place to get to, <laughs> in terms of being honest. Anyway, yeah. Okay, we're going to have to finish there. Thank you all so much for coming along and for your questions. And thank you again, David Spiegelhalter and Sally Davis. Thanks very much. For